you've got mail. Do you know the sound? You've got mail. Is it good to get a mail? How many of you have uh, written a letter recently? Letter. How many of you have received a letter recently? Well, not too many. I know some of you have uh, this beautiful habit of writing a highlights of the year letter at the end of the year in which you speak about achievements and challenges and lessons learned and even some uh, goals for the new year. Whenever I have a chance to read such a letter, I don't have that habit, unfortunately. I always feel like I'm part of the story because the letter draws you in. It makes you experience. Because a letter is not only information. Information is important, facts. But a letter shares not only information, but also love. I was a teenager, and uh, in the attic of my grandma's shed, I stumbled upon a mysterious box one day. And... I opened that magic box, and lo and behold, there was a bunch of letters in there. Love letters written to my mom by a mysterious young man I never knew about. She never told me about that young man. It was Interesting to me to discover that the name he signed with was not my father's name. So what do you think I did? I sat down first. And then I took them piece by piece. And that was the delight. It was like I was part of a story I couldn't be part of normally. Because, hey... Mom never married that guy. And I was born because of another love story. But it was so good. It was like I could spy on their feelings and I could see the sweet and spidey ingredients of, uh, of that romance. Yes, a letter. A letter has that. That was a lot of information. I discovered things I never knew about mom. But it was love that was communicated. And some of those letters were written in, on, a, on a special kind of, of paper. You know, this kind of paper, the flowery paper that you could smell. And, oh, my Lord. Yeah, you know... Some, some may think this younger generation has no idea what that is. Hey, we still write letters. We call them email, text message, um, social media posts, and um, tweets. Not the same you said? Yeah, hey, still letter. That's mini letters, you know? Who knows how many mini letters are flying right now? Hey, guys, stop it now, okay? Now we are doing letter reading, not writing. But you're right. Not the same. Something may be missing. And because society has gotten through so many transformations, so much change has happened, we have a hard time understanding what that is. A letter. A letter is a heart business. When you write a letter, you put your heart in it. When you read it, your heart jumps out of your chest. 
Because, yes, there is information communicated there. But beyond information, there is love. Did you know most of what we know as New Testament was written as letters? Who wrote most of those letters? Paul, how many? 13, 14. There's some debate if Hebrews was written by him or not. 14 plus who's the second? John has how many? Four? Letters, letters. Three, okay. And then Peter, how many? And then Jude, Luke 2, you're right. But let me, let me finish with the letters first. Jude and James. Timothy received the letter. He didn't write it. But somebody mentioned Luke. And that's correct. Did you know that both Luke's gospel and the book of Acts were originally written as letters? Go check it out. Even the name of the recipient is mentioned there. So that gives us, you know, how many? 24 out of, not 23 out of 27. Because there's one more. And whoever said John wrote four, that was correct. Because the book of Revelation is a letter. Few people realize that the book of Revelation was not written only to communicate information, facts. Yes, the book of Revelation was written to inform, to give information, to give facts, correct. But the one that wrote the book of Revelation was an old guy that loved some people that he could not be with. And he communicated in that letter both information and love. Not to mention that the one he got the content from, the angel, the one that got him the message, which is Jesus Christ. The one that gave Jesus Christ that message, God the Father himself, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, all that process speaks about not only information, but also what? Love. And that's why the book of Revelation is special, because it is written to you and me as a letter with information, but more importantly, love. If you go through it, with the right heart and mind, your heart will jump out of your chest and your mind will open up to new horizons, to new realities. And that is the book we are starting a ser sermon series from, You've Got Mail. We are still on the wave of last Sabbath, the Revelation Sabbath. And we are continuing in many ways. Some of our elders already started the verse-by-verse -verse Revelation seminar. And uh, last night they had the first meeting. So if you are interested in that verse-by-verse -verse study, please check it out and uh, go for it. But we are going to also go for a long series of sermons from the book of Revelation I'm planning to preach about 50 sermons. About 50. Know why 50? Because that's a jubilee number. And the book of Revelation has seven sections. And I would like to preach seven sermons out of each section. And then after seven times seven, which is what? I would put one more on it 
to have a jubilee. Well, I would not do that in one straight line because that would be too much. Too much of a letter reading. But over the next who knows how many years, by God's grace, I would like to go throughout the book of Revelation and bring out not only the information, that's important, but also the love. Because a letter par excellence communicates information and love. Let's go to it. Heavenly Father, we pray for your guidance, for your blessing throughout this journey that we are starting. May your spirit guide us and reveal to us the information and the love, the truth and the grace that it comes with. May step by step, each one of us feel the perfume of your revelation in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The revelation, the unveiling that is, the pulling off of the veil of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly or in quickness, that's the Greek, take place. Things that must shortly take place. When it comes to things that are going to take place or will take place, we humans are challenged. We can speak about things that have taken place. We can also speak about things that are taking place. We have a difficulty when it comes to things that are going to or will, let alone things that must take place. If you look at uh, the book of Revelation, re you realize that much of it is information about the future, or from the future if you want. Things that have to happen, that must take place in the future from the perspective of the one that received the revelation at that time. Because keep in mind, future for John is somewhat different from future for you. Because you are in history way further down than he was. There are all kind of uh, investigations of the future people try to do. And some of it is uh, charlatanism. There have been charlatans in history, famous or not so famous, who pretended to have known the future. They had the crystal ball. And you probably have heard about uh, the, the Oracle of Delphi. Have you heard about the Oracle of Delphi? That's a famous oracle in history. It is said that uh, Cressus, the king of Lydia, went to the oracle of Delphi, Pythia, that's her name, and uh, asked her if he should go to war against Xerxes, the king of the Persians. And uh, the oracle did her magic, and then uh, she said, you are going to destroy a great empire. And he was happy about it. And went to war against Xerxes, the Persian. And guess what? The oracle was right. 
Crassus destroyed a great empire, his own empire. Obviously, there's no human that can reveal the future unless somebody that knows the future reveals it to that human. Humans can have an educated guess of the future. You probably heard about uh, Alvin and Heidi Toffler. They were famous in the 70s and 80s, and they made uh, predictions, prophecies. They spoke in the 80s about the development of the internet, of mails, of um, social media, cable TV, even cloning. They also uh, pretended, or at least they claimed later, that they had predicted the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and also the economic boom of uh, Asia Pacific. And you know that's happening. But here's the difference. These people were well-informed people, and we still have those kind of people today. People that had information from behind the scene. And when you have information behind the scene, you know what's next. Because the population, by and large, never has everything that is happening behind the curtains. If you are connected to the source, based on your information, you can do some educated guess of the future. But that's not what prophecy is. Prophecy works different. Prophecy, Bible prophecy, divine revelation, the unveiling or the pulling of the veil, the removing of the curtain is something like this. Done by somebody that knows what is there before anything is there. And that is called all for knowledge. Omniscience. All for knowledge, meaning that God knows this segment in time before that segment even happened. Our way of knowledge is very different. We know when we know, we know based on the presence of the object that is to be known. This camera, I can know this camera based on its presence. God has the ability to know this camera way before this camera even exists. Now that's a different kind of knowledge because his knowledge is not dependent on the object of knowledge. And this is important to understand when it comes to the book of Revelation because many people have the impression the book of Revelation and the predictive prophecy of the book of Revelation is based on God's predestination. Doesn't the text say things that must take place? And many take it as if God decided this is going to happen. And because God decided it, that's what is going to happen. Meaning we, you and I, and everybody else on the scene of history are mere puppets. We have no contribution to history, whatever, good or bad. God decided that's history. History in advance, because normally in our minds, history is of the past. And we think history is behind us, when in reality it's not, because biblically, you don't walk toward the future like this. Facing the future, you don't know the future. Biblically, you walk toward the future like this, backwards. You don't know the future, you know the past. The past is in front of you. That's why in the book of Psalms, David says again and again, my sins are in front of me. He doesn't say my sins are behind me. Because past, your past is in front of you. Your future is behind you. You walk into the future without seeing the future. You can know 
from the future based on what? Based on divine revelation. Because he knows the future. But he doesn't know the future because he decided which player what to do in history. He knows the future based on his all foreknowledge. Meaning that every human being has the will power that contributes positively or negatively to history. This is important to take in mind, to keep in mind, because otherwise we can nurture a kind of fatalist view of history in which no matter what you do or what anybody else does, this is what God decided and this is what is going to happen. Indeed, God has a plan. And God knows how to line things up in his plan for his plan to be completed. But in that plan, you and I and every human being has a decision to make. And that is crucial when it comes to the book of Revelation. Because if the book of Revelation is not only information, but also love, we can also say about the book of Revelation that the book of Revelation is not only foretelling kind of prophecy, but also forth telling prophecy. And I will come back to this. The text continues in uh, the second part of verse 1. The revelation, the unveiling of Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly or in quickness take place it goes on more who bore verse one the second part of and that's it and he sent and signified and that's the famous word semaino in greek he signified it by his angel to his servant John. And if you remember last Sabbath, Dr. Ranko Stefanovich listed four sources to decipher the content of those signs or symbols that are signified in the book of Revelation. The first big source, obviously, is the Old Testament. He spoke about that. He spent uh, an hour even more on that. So that's the first source, the Old Testament. We can have it up there. But then we also have New Testament parallels in the book of Revelation. So in order to understand the book of Revelation, you don't need only the Old Testament to crack the code. You also need the New Testament. Let me give you an example. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And I saw in the right hand, or on, or at the right of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Watch this. The Greek text, the Greek text doesn't have the word hand. Please move that verse back so we can see. See, you have the word hand. The Greek text says, And I saw at the right of him who sat on the throne. When you read this, do you remember anything from the New Testament that uses that concept of at the right? Yes? When Jesus died and was resurrected and then ascended to the Father, where did he sit? Where? To the right. So that's the picture there. So the book, the scroll is at the right of the one sitting on the throne, God the Father. Why? Because Jesus, as he comes victorious from planet Earth, takes the book and does what? Sits down. Where? At his right. See? The parallel with other New Testament passages? There's another source as well to understand the symbols, the semaino, the signifying of the book of Revelation. And that is Greco-Roman culture of the time. 
Look, for instance, at uh, the passage in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Very well-known picture. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, what? What did he say? A white horse. And he who sat on him was called, what? Faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Who's that sitting on the white horse? Jesus Christ, correct. But why is he sitting on a white horse? Is there white horses, are there white horses in heaven? That's the point. That's a good question, isn't it? Do you think there are white horses in heaven? But let me make it easier. Have you ever seen, outside of the book of Revelation, a white horse in the Bible? A white horse, specifically? In a picture where somebody sits on that horse and that someone judges and makes war? No, you have not. You have seen Jesus on a donkey. Un burro. A donkey. But why isn't Jesus coming on a donkey? Because in the mind of the first century write, uh, writer and reader, people of the first century, the white horse, somebody riding that magnificent white horse, who's that? Who's that? As the Roman emperor... Or a representative thereof. But can you put that on stage there that Jesus is stronger than the Roman emperor? You cannot. You have to use a symbol that they will get it. That hey, those folks that exiled me to Patmos. They are not stronger than him. He's got the white horse. When he's coming back. Guess what? He's going to be riding not a donkey, but what? A white horse. He is the ruler. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Ah. It clicks immediately, right? And there's one more source. In uh, one of the writings of uh, Jewish apocalyptic literature, Jewish apocalyptic literature is intertestamental kind of literature. And uh, there's a book called Ezra 4, or fourth book of Ezra. And watch, see what it says, verses 35 and 36. Did not the souls, oh, souls, keep that in mind, of the righteous in their chambers ask about these matters, saying, how long are we to remain here? And the answer is, when the number of those like yourselves is completed. Can you find that somewhere in the book of Revelation? Not exactly like that, but something very similar. Look in chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. And they cried with a loud voice. Who are those that cried with a loud voice? Who? The souls from under the altar. Ah. And they said, how long, O Lord, how holy and true until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And the answer is, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren was completed. See, not exactly the same picture, but it gives you some background information so you can crack the code of this section of the book of Revelation. But you, you may think, okay, so uh, you have a book written in uh, symbols. What is that good for? If the people don't understand those symbols. If they don't know the code. Did they know the code? Those that received, those that were the recipients of the book? Verse 3 goes on, verse 3 in chapter 1, and uh, it speaks about the blessed. 
You don't have verse 3 there? Verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads. And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. If those that received the book did not understand it, could they be blessed or happy about it? Because that's the Greek word, happy, makarios, to be happy about it. Now, you receive a book, a letter, you start reading it. That's, that's a happy encounter, I would say, because I don't know if you realize for most of history, reading has been a luxury. So if you can read, that's a blessing itself. And even, even from among those that can read without understanding, if you are one of those that can read and understand, even better. Because there is functional illiteracy, what they call it. When somebody can read but does not understand what he or she may read. But what is interesting in what it says here, oh yeah, the verse was there, but it was mistaken reference. Good. So the point here is that somebody had to read the book, the letter, because not everybody could read. Notice that the reader is in singular, he who reads, because not everybody was able to read. If you are able to read, praise the Lord. That's fantastic. Those who hear, however, is in plural. Imagine this. One day, the elder of the church comes to the congregation and says, Brothers, sisters, we've got mail. From whom? From Elder John. Elder John, he's on the island of Patmos. Yes, he wrote a letter to us. And uh, he, he has something to communicate. But because you love Elder John, and you know Elder John loves you, what does that letter communicate? Information and? So you can't wait to sit down and have that person that can read, read it to you. Is it a happy moment? Is it a blessed moment? Of course it is. But please notice that the hearer is also encouraged to keep because you are blessed if you hear, but also keep or heed those things which are written in the book. And now you may ask, okay, if, if they could only read but not understand, that can be still happy. Like if you can read Greek, but you don't understand Greek. Greek has different letters or Hebrew. You can read it, but you don't understand it. That's still happy, you know, because, hey, you, you are one step further than other people. But if you just read and you don't understand, how can you heed, keep those things? The text proves that those that received the book must have understood, or at least some of them must have understood. Because in fairness, the book of Revelation was not meant for everybody to understand it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me repeat that because, because that can be a little against what we have in our minds. The book of Revelation was not meant for everybody to understand it. Did you know that Jesus often spoke in a way that was meant to reveal and conceal at the same time? When he spoke in what? Parables. Some, some would come to him and ask him, uh, Master, why do you use parables? And he kind of tells them, hey, listen. Some people have to understand. Some people have to be confused. Same applies here. Yes, there was a recipient, plural, for the book of Revelation. 
so they will understand the book of Revelation. For the letter that John wrote from the angel, from Jesus Christ, from the Father. Of course. But the book of Revelation was written to reveal and to conceal at the same time. Who was supposed to understand? Well, the seven churches, they were supposed to understand. And by extension, the seven historical periods, we'll see later, was supposed, were supposed to understand. You and I, I guess, are supposed to understand. But who should not have understood? Imagine you have family in a communist country, in North Korea, or Cuba, or some other totalitarian regime. And somebody from that country, a family member of yours, writes a letter for you. A letter that contains some very sensitive content about the regime that exists there. If they write in plain language, when will that letter get to you? Never. So what do they have to do? They have to come up with a code and write that letter in a code that you know. And you have that code. How do you have that code? Because you grew up together. You have family stories together. You know culture together. There are sources where, with clever mind, if they put together the right pictures, you will get it. I used this illustration a few years ago down in Florida somewhere. And uh, among other people in the pew was sitting a Cuban lady, very outspoken. And at the end of the sermon came to me and told me, Pastor, we still do that. I'm here and they are there, and that's how we communicate. That's how we communicate on the phone. That's how we communicate in writing. If you didn't know what was going on, you would say we are crazy, we are stupid. Something similar happens here. Not just because John was so smart that he knew how to pass what to pass. Censorship. Because you are on an island isolated on Patmos. And one day, most likely on a Sabbath day, you are in the spirit and you start seeing things and you start hearing voices and uh, you are asked to write it down. But you know some of the content that you are receiving are very problematic, very sensitive content with regard to the regime. What regime was John the Apostle exiled under? Roman Empire? Did you know? A lot of the book of Revelation speaks about the Roman Empire. Or... The continuation of it? So I'm asking you, if John had written in plain language, if the Holy Spirit had not messed the things up in visions, in a movie that he had to write down and then send, when would have that letter reached the churches? Never. See, see what the background of the book of Revelation is? Yes, the book, uh, book of Revelation was meant to be understood by some. And it was meant to be misunderstood by some others. Because when the censor, the Roman general or officer or whatever, came to take that letter, you know, poor old guy wrote a letter. He wanted to send it home to his family or churches, whoever. He would go through it. And at one point when he would read about dragons, beasts, and uh, a harlot sitting on a beast, 
poor guy. He totally lost his mind. Put that scroll there and let it go. Let it reach its destination. But in that letter, if you knew the code, there was information and there was what? Love. Because God was revealing. God was foretelling, and I said, forth telling. You know what the difference is? There's a misconception that prophecy is always about revealing the future. False. Prophecy, biblical prophecy, has two components. One is foretelling. It has to do with the future. And the other one is forth telling. It has to do with the present. And yes, the book of Revelation carries both. And watch this. As you go through history, as you go down the path of history, wherever you stand, the foretelling prophecy that is discovered, that is being understood in your time. In other words, the things you can understand from the book of Revelation at this time, in our age here, that foretelling prophecy becomes for you a fourth telling prophecy. Did you follow me? How, you may think. Well, this is how. God's intention is not only for you to know the future. I would risk say that he doesn't even care about that, really. For you to be able to tell the future. No, that's not the point. God's intention is that when you see how he evolves, how he unfolds in history, when you understand what is happening in that moment of history in which you are right now, what he predicted, what he foretold at that time through John is a fourth telling for you right now. Meaning, you should ask the question, you have that question actually in the Bible when the Apostle Peter writes and he says, if all these things are going to happen, then what? You know what the question is? If all the, he speaks about how everything will pass, how, how fire uh, will melt everything down, and he says, if all these are going to happen, then what? What kind? Of people should we be. And that's how the foretelling becomes forth telling. I'm asking you, in all fairness, what do you feel when you read the book of Revelation? Are you happy? Or are you frustrated? That's a big difference. You know, when I was a teenager, because, yeah, I was born in an age when, when these were still under circulation. You, you would still write letters. And I would receive letters, love letters. I sent a few myself. And I would also receive love letters. Uh, not too many, I don't think. Everybody wrote love letters to Joe. But it was such a big celebration when we saw the male man stop in front of our house and tell us, you got mail. That was such a celebration. And I would run to see who got the letter, whose name was on the envelope. And I did that for a reason. My mom liked letters too. And she would catch the letter and if I'm not home, she would open it and read it and have fun. <laughs> and I, I even had to go to the mailman and to, to tell him, listen, when I have a letter, when my name is on the letter, don't give it to anybody. 
But still, if I wasn't home, he would leave it. And mom would take it. And sometimes I would go home and I would find a happy mom. And she would know things about me I didn't know. And I was like, mom, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do this. What? I don't have to t the, the right to be happy? I guess you do. Read your letters, not mine. One winter, I was in my first year of college. I had a homework. I had to translate some um, content from the history of religion from English into Romanian. Now, this was, I, I had some English knowledge, but very, very poor. Okay, and this was a very technical kind of writing. And the, the professor was torturing us practically, gave us the work to do for him to have the access to the information. So uh, I had a hard time doing the translation, but I knew someone uh, that uh, had very good English, and uh, she offered to translate some of that content for me, and she did it in writing. There was no computers at the magnitude we have them today. So she translated in writing, and a big bunch of paper was put into an envelope and sent out as a letter. You've got mail. Mom was home. I wasn't. So you, you can guess the process. She immediately took the letter, and when she saw, hmm, this is thick. Now I have fun. And she, she started reading, and it was, it was in a language she could understand, but she could not understand. It was like, yeah, I, I understand the words, but I don't know what it says. So I'm coming home later that uh, afternoon, and I find an open envelope and a frustrated mom. I go to it and I realize what had happened. It's frustrating. But if it's frustrating, was it written for you? If you can't read it, if you, or if you can read it but you can't understand it so you can heed it? When I took my first class with Dr. Stefanovic, I remember well, he told us, guys, I need you to read through the book of Revelation. Many, many times, many, many times, many, many times. How many times? Ten times? No, a hundred of times. Two hundreds of times. And we were like, okay. And he said, guys, if you do that, you will see that when you read it a hundred twenty-third time, things will open up for you. How? He said, it's simple. You already know the code. You just don't know how to use it. If you go through the book of Revelation again and again and again and again, clips from the Old Testament and the New Testament, things you already know, will be enlightened and you will suddenly be able to see that when Jesus takes the scroll, that wants to say, oh, this is the enthronement of the king of the Old Testament. Ah, very interesting. So things will be enlightened. So if you're frustrated, don't give up thinking this is not for you. Read it again and again. Go through it. Follow the storyline because this is a story. It's the rest of the story. It was stopped at ascension. It continues in the book of Revelation. You will get it if you have the code. Go and read it again and again, and it will stop the confusion. It will come out as new pictures that find their place and fall into their right place. This is very important. But watch this. If you keep reading it, and you've re read it a hundred of times, 
200 of times. Maybe you have to learn the code first and then go back to it. I always tell people, maybe the book of Revelation is not for you yet. I'm not saying it's not for you. That's a different kind of uh, understanding. The book of Revelation may not be for you yet. Because if you don't know the code, you will come up with a story that has nothing to do with the book of Revelation. And that is a problem. If we have not understood the rest of the Bible, because the rest of the Bible is a love letter too, it communicates information and love, and I may be already driving you crazy with, uh, with truth and grace, grace and truth. If we have not gotten it yet, if we go to the book of Revelation, it will come across as a story about monsters. When it's in fact a story about the lamb that becomes lion. And that's a beautiful, beautiful story. So here's what I would like to place on your heart. Read the book of Revelation. Read it like a story. Allow it to permeate, to penetrate. But if, if nothing happens, if those pictures will not start popping up, then work on the code. And I'm saying this because we live in a world where Christians, those that have the Bible as their base of faith, have gotten to a point of biblical illiteracy. And there's no way to understand the book of Revelation biblically illiterate. We need to know the code, that is the rest of it, so we will be able to understand it. That is crucial. And when you read the book of Revelation, if you indeed have the code, something magical will happen. Something amazing will happen. I remember the time I started to learn Spanish. I started learning Spanish haphazardly. I already shared this with you probably in some other settings. I stumbled upon a video, actually an audio on YouTube of Pastor Alejandro Bullon. I knew no Spanish. I just heard the voice. But there's something about hearing the word of God. I, I remember I heard a voice and I didn't know who that was. If it was a pastor, I guessed it was a pastor. I didn't know if he was Seventh-day Adventist. But the voice was so compelling, the reading of it was so compelling that I had to start learning Spanish. But how did I start learning? I downloaded a bunch of sermons from the internet, from torrents, and put them on some DVDs. I had a DVD player in my car. And because I used to travel a lot, I had a large district to cover, I would listen and listen and listen with no other background. Funny thing, one day, somebody was hitchhiking. I stopped, and I took that person into my car. And after two or three minutes, the person tells me, that's a sermon, isn't it? I said, yes. Do you understand Spanish? No. <laughs> huh. But I knew it was a sermon. Because there was something about it. I'm trying to, to explain that the Holy Spirit takes over. That's what I'm trying to, to make you feel somehow. When you listen to it, maybe an audio book, you will see things, start seeing things that you would not otherwise. 
And what happened to me is this. After a while, just listening to those sermons, I started connecting the dots. Because there was a word here that I could grasp because of some other language backgrounds. This word was similar to Romanian. This grammar structure was very much alike. And after a while, I could translate that sermon. Yes, the book of Revelation has to be translated from the code into plain language. And the Holy Spirit, when you are really into it, will take over. That's the point. Amen? Amen.